Today I want to encourage your hearts, hopefully, from God's Word as we talk about looking beyond the surface and discovering love, grace, and hope. Looking beyond the surface and discovering grace, love, grace, and hope. And you know, when we talk about this, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that you, you may not think about when you hear that title. So turn with me to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, very familiar passage to all of us where <coughs> sin is introduced into the world. After Adam and Eve chose to sin against God, we read that of course, God addressed what had taken place with them and told them what the results would be for uh, their sin. Of course, the ultimate result for sin is death. And then we see that they had sewed leaves together to make themselves coverings because before sin came into the world, there was no shame from the nakedness that they had. But once sin came into the world, their eyes were opened, they covered themselves up. And then we see in Genesis 3.21, it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. See, that's the first shedding of blood in the Bible, actually the first physical death in the Bible. God took the life of an animal and clothed Adam and Eve, and it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden, from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Father, we ask your blessings upon uh, your word today, and we pray that you will help us in our own lives today to look beyond the surface and to discover your love, your grace, and the hope you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. On the surface, we'll start with that. On the surface, as we talk about looking beyond the surface, we're going to see in this passage the surface, uh, there's a lot of negative. There's a lot of heartbreak in this particular chapter. On the surface, a tree is placed in the garden that eating from it would result in death. Separation from God suffering, pain on an unimaginable level. People wonder, well, why did God place the tree in the garden to begin with? We see back in Genesis 2, beginning in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, or in dying thou shalt die. You know, here this tree is placed there, and disobedience would result in death. You know, death can be summed up in one word, separation. And this is the first mention of death in the Bible. And when we think of this separation, which I said can summarize death, we look at two different types of death, really three. The first is, of course, a physical death. 
Adam and Eve at that point when they disobeyed God there in Genesis 3 verse 6 it says and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat okay so at this point physical death began wasn't in God's original plan, but in a sense it was, because God being all-knowing knew what would actually happen. And that's where people struggle. Well, if God knew what would happen, why did he allow it? Why did he allow this tree to be placed in the garden to begin with? And we'll get to that. But the second type of death or separation is uh, spiritual. It's spiritual. It's uh, being separated in our direct fellowship with God. And scripture talks about those that are not saved, those that are outside of Christ are dead in their trespasses and sins. And then there's eternal death. Because if you see, if you die and you're spiritually dead, you will be eternally separated from God in hell. That's what God's word makes very clear. So it, it's very gloomy on the surface so far. And as I said, we see not only a tree placed in the garden, that eating from it would result in death, separation from God, suffering, pain, and on an unimaginable level, but we also see their clear disobedience to God. Eve took of the fruit and ate and gave to Adam with her and he ate. Then the third thing we see there is sin enters the world. Romans 5 uh, verse 12 says, Wherefore as by one man, Adam, sin entered to the world, and death by sin. That's where death came from. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. We've all been infected with sin. Then we see, again as I've already mentioned, the immediate spiritual death evidenced by Adam and Eve in chapter 3 verses 7 through 10 the evidence it's evidenced by shame and hiding from God it says in verse 7 um, there in chapter 3 the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and they heard the voice or that word could be translated sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So we see that spiritual death, separation from God's direct fellowship, the moment of their sin, they died spiritually. Things began to change. Never before would they have hid from God. Never before did they experience shame. And then we see avoiding personal responsibility. Have any of you ever played the, the blame game? Wives, have your husband ever played the blame game? Husbands, have your wives ever played the blame game? You are not have responded, but I know you have. Okay? At least once. What's the blame game? We look around when something goes wrong to see who we're going to blame it on, right? Well, that began here. And that hadn't taken place before. In Genesis 3, verse 11, it said, When God asked Adam, Who told you that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the, the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And then Eve talks about how the serpent beguiled her, and she did eat, and they're, they're avoiding personal responsibility. Then we see Adam and Eve in chapter, this chapter, they'll be living in a cursed world. The world became cursed, uh, and it began with Adam and Eve and would extend to their descendants. Guess what? You and I are experiencing a sin-cursed world. What does that mean? Well, in verse 14, we see the animal kingdom was cursed. He said to the serpent that allowed Satan to use him to tempt Eve, he, he said, uh, Cursed, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. So animals were cursed. The ground was cursed. It said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. We see pain and hardship introduced into the human race in verses 16 and 19. 
we see that Adam and Eve's personal efforts were rejected. Yes, the eyes of them were opened and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, some people use this verse and say, well, God made the human body and it's okay to have pornography and nudity because God made the human body and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Well, you know what? When Adam and Eve sinned, they had shame. And what did they do? They covered up. Okay? But their covering was not sufficient. And we see in verse 21, as we've already read, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So, so far, we're on a downward spiral when we just look at the surface of negative. Right? We're seeing death introduced, suffering, pain, not only to Adam and Eve, but to God's creation. Then we see the loss of their home. It says in verses 22 through 24 of Genesis 3, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. That little word, us, I believe is a reference to a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life. Now, the tree of life was another of the trees of the garden that he could eat freely from. But now that sin had come into the world, eating from the tree of life would be actually a problem. And we'll get to that. But unless he take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, verse 24, and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You, you with me so far? Bleak, sad surface. But now we're going to dig below the surface. And this is when we see some special things. We're going to discover love, we're going to discover grace, and we're going to discover hope. First, beyond the surface, we discover love. In Genesis 2.17, we see the tree placed in the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God tells them clearly, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, you see, the very argument that people will, will bring up, well, why did God put it there to begin with if he knew they were going to eat of it, can be summed up like this. Because relationship is absolutely important to God. You might say, well, to take of that tree broke any fellowship or relationship Adam and Eve had with God. But bear with me, because relationship is important to God, he sovereignly chose to give man the freedom to choose. Okay, let this sink in for a moment. Because relationship is important to God, he sovereignly gave man the freedom to choose. You see, God created the fact of freedom by putting that tree in the garden. Therefore, by doing that, though, he made evil possible. Humans made evil actual by partaking of the fruit. Let's go a step further, though. As I said, relationship is important to God. You see, God created the fact of freedom so we can choose to love. Forced love is a contradiction of terms. Think about your relationships. Husband, wife, children, grandchildren, very best friends. Aren't you glad they choose to love you? And it's not forced? Because I said, forced love is a contradiction of terms. Love, true love, is a choice. True love is giving of oneself. True love is sacrificial. True love is not as interested in what can I get from this relationship, but what can I give? 
And by the very tree in that Garden of Eden that God allowed that caused sin to come into the world, with that he also allowed us to be able to choose whether we're going to love him or not, whether we're going to obey him or not. He didn't make us like robots. He didn't make us like slaves that we have to jump and obey everything he says. You see, because of love, we should be obedient to the Lord, not because we are forced to. You see, throughout Scripture, God repeatedly says the words, I love you. And sometimes we read right over them in the Bible. In Ephesians 2 verse 4 it says that God has a great love wherewith he's loved us. In Ephesians 3.19 it says, To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. 1 John tells us in chapter 4, He loved us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It says it two times there in 1 John 4, 10 and 11. God loved us. 1 John 4, 19 says He first loved us. We love God because He first loved us. He initiated it. We're told in Galatians 2, 20 that, that, that talking about the Son of God who loved me and it talks about the extent of that love and gave Himself for me. We're told in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. That's a lot of love. And we think sometimes there's, there's pain and suffering we experience and we, we look around and we try to find out who we're going to blame. And there's God. Well, God allowed it. He could have stopped it. He doesn't know anything about this. Yes, He does. He knows quite a bit about pain and suffering. The greatest of all of God's commandments comes back to loving Him with our total being. Dr. Charles Stanley said, Knowing God should be the lifelong pursuit of each believer. You know why? Because that's what God wants from you and I. He wants a relationship. He wants a love relationship. And from the surface of here's this tree and we question why it's there to begin with but we look below the surface and we see God gave you and I free will to choose. And there will be people on judgment day that may have the courage enough to mouth off at God which I wonder if they will or not but, and say well God why are you condemning me to hell? But God gave you a choice. God gave you a choice. You see, God taught us in Scripture to pray, Thy will be done, right? On the day of judgment, God's going to say to the lost, Thy will be done. Or He could say to the lost. I don't know if He'll use those words or not, but you get what I'm saying. Because when people are condemned to an eternal hell, they've chosen. They've chosen. So it doesn't do any good to look around and blame God because the price has been paid for everyone to be forgiven. It is a free gift, but man is not willing to turn from their sin, repent, and embrace what Jesus did on the cross for them. You see, too many Christians are content, I'm talking about Christians now, they're content to know Jesus as their Savior and never move past that point. Never move past that point. Ask yourself this, have you moved past that point today? Are you content just knowing Him as your Savior and that you're going to have a home in heaven but there's no desire for anything else? Christians many times are more content having a superficial and shallow relationship with, with the Lord. The more frequently, though, we spend time with God, the more familiar we become actually with His voice. Intimacy requires, intimacy with God requires those quiet moments when God can speak clearly to our heart and when we can speak honestly to Him. So the first thing I see beyond the surface of 
that God had a purpose behind that, that man could be free to choose to obey God, to love God, to have a relationship with God, or he could choose not to. Second thing beyond the surface I see is we discover grace. What is grace? There's a lot of definitions to grace. I've given them to you before. Uh, one is God's kindness toward us. One is grace is getting what we do not deserve. Grace is God's kindness to those that deserve His wrath. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. So where's the grace here? Notice Genesis 3.15. This is the first gospel. He says to the serpent that there was a spiritual being behind Satan. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's an interesting statement as we're reading through Genesis. We see that the serpent who really instigated the temptation using uh, being used of Satan, the serpent instigating this temptation uh, would experience enmity between him and the woman. But there's a spiritual being behind the serpent, remember that. And between his seed, the lost, and her seed, the seed of the woman, you usually hear of the seed of the man. Well, here we hear of the seed of the woman, which would be Mary. The first gospel. The first indication of the good news. It says, the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. In other words, deal a death blow. But thou shalt bruise his heel. And Christ's heel was definitely bruised on Calvary when he died on the cross for our sins. So we see grace right here in this chapter with all of this that's going on as God is holding, the blame game didn't work. You see, God held Adam responsible. He held Eve responsible. He held the serpent responsible. And he held the spiritual being behind that serpent responsible. And he basically is saying here in the first gospel, the first mention of the gospel in scripture, he, he's saying exactly the good news that we need to hear. Then it goes on, and we read in verse 21 earlier, And to Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The first shedding of blood. The first allusion to what would actually take place that verse 15 was talking about, Thou shalt bruise his heel. Because when Christ died on the cross, remember, we've talked about this and studied this, he was beaten beyond recognition. He shed his blood. Why? Why? There was a purpose behind it. And that purpose was so you and I could be forgiven. That you and I could have a relationship with God that we could have no other way. So we see the grace of God poured out in the shedding of this animal's blood. Verse 7 of chapter 3, we see that the, their personal efforts were totally rejected by God. They sewed fig leaves together to try to make themselves aprons or coverings and you know what that is that's an example of how man today tries to take care of his sin problem himself instead of sewing fig leaves together man tries to turn over a new leaf make some new year's resolutions uh, determined to do better and all of those things fall completely short and the whole time god's grace is there. God's grace is sufficient. Beyond the surface, we also see and discover hope. We discover hope. The text I started reading at the beginning of the service, where the Lord God took man and sent him forth from the Garden of Eden and, and posted a cherubim there uh, at the entrance to the garden with a flaming sword uh, so they could not have access to the tree of life. You see, eating of the tree of life, 
would have enabled Adam and Eve to have lived forever. Okay? Well, you say, well, that's not bad. That seems like that would have been the cure for the tree of knowledge of good and evil that brought death. Here's the problem, though. Eating from the tree of life would cause him to live, but he would be living in a sinful state for eternity. By the way, the tree of life is brought back up uh, in the future. You and I will encounter the tree of life. That will be something uh, when we get to heaven, uh, the new heaven and the new earth, we'll get to experience. But if Adam had got a hold of that thing, he could have lived in a state of sin continually. So what do I see beyond the surface that gives hope? I see hope of not continuing in a sin-cursed state. Do you know, I've shared this before, before I was saved, I could sin and not think too much of it. I really couldn't. I, I'd feel a twinge of guilt because I knew my mom and dad didn't want me doing something, but I really did what I wanted to do, pretty much. All of that changed when I trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Didn't understand it at the time, but my life started to change from the inside out. I didn't just all of a sudden, as some people say, become religious. It was a change on the inside. And that change is evidence of our salvation. I found that out later. I didn't know it at the time. And as we look at this, that change is happening. And so I began little by little separating myself from the things that would grieve the heart of God. Because they began to grieve my own heart. Now, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. Not perfect. Not near perfect. But I feel like over the years, I've grown and am consistently trying to become more like Jesus Christ. And hopefully that's your testimony as well. But when I get to heaven, I will be like him. Scripture teaches that. For the child of God, when they get to heaven, they will have uh, a complete new life. We have a new life in the sense of we're a new creation now. And God, through the Holy Spirit's working in our lives, changing us, uh, bringing about a, a, a transformation. So in a sense, my hope of not continuing in a sin-cursed world started at my own salvation. God delivered me from a bunch of that stuff. And some of you could give testimony of how you've been delivered from a bunch of stuff too. But the complete deliverance is going to happen when we leave this world. Okay? So the grace behind Adam and Eve not getting to partake of that tree of life was, yes, they would experience death. But they would not continue throughout time in their sin. Also, we see the hope of an intimate relationship with God, one that He created us for. How's that? Well, Adam and Eve would go out, have children, the world, the descendants of the world, and, and people would have a responsibility then with the freedom God had given them to choose. I have the hope of heaven, not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm some good person. I have the hope of heaven completely because of what Jesus did on a cross some 2,000 years ago. Hopefully you have that hope. If you don't, that's a hope that I'm presenting to you that you can have. You can have relationship with the God of the universe. Because of His grace. Because of His love. And as we read through Genesis chapter 3, again, on the surface, we see a downward spiral of things. But when we start discovering what's underneath all that, we do see love and grace and hope in the face of tragedy. So today, the question is, what do you need to discover beyond the surface of your life? Think about that. What do you need to discover beyond the surface of your life? You see, on the surface, there are unfavorable circumstances. 
I know there are unfavorable circumstances known throughout this congregation. We face them from time to time, don't we? Some are more favorable than others, but there are unfavorable circumstances. Then sometimes there's clouds on the horizon. What could those clouds be? Maybe an unexpected expense. Maybe a tragic report on our health. Maybe a broken relationship. And it's just getting worse. There's clouds on the horizon. There are financial setbacks, as I alluded to. Declines in health. There are strained and broken relationships. There's heartaches that others just don't understand. Again, I try to be very careful about telling people, and I see this on television a lot. People will say, well, I know how you feel. No, you don't. No, you don't. We may have been through similar circumstances, but it's very hard to tell somebody I know how you feel. Because we don't. I can't tell many in our congregation that for the simple reason I've not been through what you've been through. But at the same time, there is one person that can tell you that. And that's the Lord because He knows He's touched with the feelings of your weaknesses and what you experience. There's fear and anxiety still out there. You know, we've had a very fearful, anxious year and that, that's still out there. Still out there. These are all the things on the surface. You cut the news on you hear of death from automobile accidents. You hear about death from murder. You hear about all kinds of uh, dishonesty and, and stuff going on and, and conflict within our government. And you look around and if, if you just look on the surface, you say, man, this is bad. Let me give you some thoughts about beyond the surface. Beyond the surface, there is an incomprehensible, we can't comprehend him, infinite, that means limitless, God who has a plan for your life. Do you realize that? God has a plan for your life. God has such a plan for my life and your life that he knows the moment of your death. He knew the moment of your birth. You know, when babies are born, the doctors give a, a due date and they project it or they schedule a C-section or something. But God knows every detail. Scripture says God knows so much of the detail for us that He's weaving us together in our mother's womb. And He has a plan for you. And this God is a God that we cannot comprehend and is limitless. And He has a plan for your life. One thing God tells us about his plan, he says that he's not willing, that means he does not desire that anyone perish, but that you receive forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. But the tragedy will be, because of freedom, there will be some that will not believe, there will be some that will prolong and put off, and there will be some that will flat out reject the love, grace, and hope that God offers. <coughs> there will be some that spend their life in a church pew and go straight to hell when they die because it was never real. But beyond the surface, that God is there. And we can't fully comprehend him, but we got to understand, because he is incomprehensible, we can't expect to understand him. He's limitless, and that particular God has a plan for us. Secondly, there is a God who absolutely loves you and desires an intimate relationship with you. When I think of this, I think... Back when I was a, a young person, I've told you before, my mom passed away when I was 15 years old. And honestly, she was the closest person in my life. Totally. And I remember very clearly kneeling by her hospital bed, praying 
that God would heal her when she was in such a state she didn't even recognize me dying. But as a result of God taking her out of here, which was hard for me, still is when I think about it, I came to faith in Christ and that played into me. Because that was part of God's plan. And you know what? God absolutely loves me and you and shows that love in ways sometimes we do not even recognize. You see, we look at God and we think He's untouched by the feelings of our infirmities, but He's a personal being. God of the Bible is, has an intellect. He has feelings, emotions. And part of that is He loves you. He loves you. His love seeks your highest good and is unconditional. You might say, well, I don't feel it. You know what? Growing up when your parents loved on you, sometimes their love was hard, wasn't it? Sometimes you preferred not to have that love in given certain ways, but they had a plan that you didn't grow up to be some kind of scandal. That's one of those old terms, isn't it? Scandal. Also, beyond the surface, there is a God who is touched with your pain, your heartache, and your questions. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Starting in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, speaking of Jesus, that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, or we could say confession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You may want to underscore that if you haven't. We have not an high priest, speaking of Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16, in view of this, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, not a throne of judgment for the believer, but a throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a God that's touched with my pain, my heartache, my questions. There's a God whose character and ways are completely trustworthy. There is a God whose character and ways are completely trustworthy. I love reading through Scripture, coming upon a character quality of the Lord, an attribute of God, and highlighting it or underlining it. And I encourage you strongly to do that because as we do that, we find that our God is a good God. He is a good God. Do you know, even when the bottom falls out of things with us, He's a good God. Scripture says He is righteous and that He is just. That means He always does the right thing. The right thing. He's wise. Wisdom talks about being able to rightly apply knowledge. And since God is all-knowing, He is all-wise as well. He's faithful. What does that mean? It means He's trustworthy and dependable. This day and time, it's hard to find people sometimes that are trustworthy and dependable. People that are going to keep their word. God does that. He's merciful. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. What does Peyton Fitzgerald deserve today? Hail. Hail. But for the blood of Christ. God is gracious. We've touched on that. The word that describes God as unchanging is immutable. That means he does not change. That gives me confidence that the God that's described in the Bible is the same God that I have to deal with and that deals with me. He's unchanging. 
God is completely sovereign. And that means he is in absolute control. There's not a devil or demon or person that's going to be able to overrule what God wants. You see, we can do a lot to try to adjust what God's doing in our lives or fix what God may be trying to do in our lives. But if God wants it, he's going to work and he's going to work on us. Lastly, there is a God who wants you and I to trust him with every aspect of our lives. Do you realize that? There is a God who wants you and I to trust him with every aspect of our life. As we said a couple of weeks ago, there is one thing to say we trust in God, but there's something completely different to apply and live out that trust. We've got to remember, there are some things we're not going to fully understand in this life. Sometimes we make that foolish assumption that our God has no right to insist that we trust Him unless He makes His limitless, infinite wisdom completely understandable to us. And that's getting it completely wrong. We read in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, my, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Wow. God wants us to trust Him with every aspect of our lives. There could very well be some here today that need to trust Him for your eternity. You know who you are. There might be some of you here that have been in this church a long time. But you know you're not right with God. You might have your husband or your wife fooled, your mom or dad. You may have the preacher fooled. But you know deep down been said we correctly interpret a situation only when we turn from the immediate to the ultimate. You see, the immediate many times is on the surface. The ultimate is what we discover below the surface. What is God doing? Let's bow our heads.